All right, well, we'll talk a little bit about ethylene oxide sterilization. And ethylene oxide, is, it's one of two methods that people use if they're sterilizing a medical device. They're either going to use radiation or they're going to use ethylene oxide if they're sterilizing on a large scale. And the reason they would use ethylene oxide, it, it's very popular for devices that cannot stand high temperatures like they would with steam sterilization. So a lot of devices made out of plastics that would melt. Um, it's used a lot for devices that because a lot of these devices tend to be plastics, a lot of the plastics don't do well with radiation. There's material compatibility issues where the plastics get brittle or they cross-link and there's, there's bad changes. They maybe change color where it would, the device would work okay, but it looks, doesn't look good. So the, the manufacturer chooses to go with a different way so their product looks better. So ethylene oxide is the other way that people will go with for a lot of those types of devices. That's very popular with uh, kits because inevitably in a kit there's many different components that some of those may not be able to be sterilized with radiation. So maybe most of it can be, but there's usually something in there that can't be sterilized with radiation. So the custom kit business, where a lot of times they'll design these designer trays for a specific procedure like a heart surgery, they're custom for each doctor or each procedure. So there's you know, all kinds of different components in there. So some of those aren't going to be able to be sterilized with radiation, so they're going to go with ethylene oxide. So that's really driven the growth of the ethylene oxide industry. So roughly a little over 50% of the, the devices that are sterilized are sterilized with ethylene oxide. So it's about half of the market share. So a customer, if they decide to use ethylene oxide, there's a series of testing that they have to go through to find out if it's going to be a good option. First of all, they have to find out if their packaging and their product can withstand it, the functionality that it's going to affect it. Ethylene oxide is pretty gentle on products, so there's not a lot of issues with ethylene oxide damaging the products, although it does have to be packaged into some type of porous packaging, like Tyvek or paper. Tyvek is probably the most common one. That's, that way it's breathable, because in an ethylene oxide process, you have a series of vacuum and pressure changes where you pull a vacuum, you're going to add air, and so the, the vacuum or the uh, packaging has to be able to withstand these changes in pressure. So it has to be some type of breathable packaging. The things you cannot sterilize with ethylene oxide would be anything such as glass, um, metal. It's not going to penetrate through metals, but you can sterilize the outer surface of metals. You can't sterilize liquids. So once they decide that ethylene oxide is the route that they want to go, there's uh, some of upfront testing that they have to do to find out, first of all, can the device be sterilized with ethylene oxide? And then secondly, is this, is this going to work with this product? How long is the cycle going to have to be? So there's what's called cycle development that has to be done. So to be able to do that, what they're going to do is they're going to take the product and they're going to inoculate the product in all the locations on the device that are going to be hard to sterilize. They're going to inoculate it with spores of an organism called Bacillus atrophius. That's the indicator organism with ethylene oxide. It's the organism that's been shown to be the most resistant to sterilization. So they inoculate each site on this product that's going to be difficult to sterilize with one million spores. And they have to show that they can kill those one million spores in half of the normal cycle time. So it's, it's what's called an overkill process. As you can see, we are killing one million of these really highly resistant spores in half of the time. That's where the overkill is brought into it. So they do this upfront testing called comparative resistance to find out how long does it take to sterilize this. Once they figure that out, then they know what cycle that they can tell the contract sterilizer that we're going to need a three-hour half cycle, a six-hour full cycle. So at that point, then they go to the contract sterilizer to do the validation there. And now we're at the point where we're at the contract sterilizer and we have our load size that we wish to sterilize. So the, the ethylene oxide standard is ISO 11135. There's parts one and part two. It's a two-part document, and that's the requirements to do your validation. You have to comply with this document. There's several other related standards that uh, AME TIRs or technical information reports that go along with that. And these all give guidance on how you do a validation. But uh, there's, there's a little bit of difference of how you can do your validation. But for the most part, what you're going to do is you're going to have an empty chamber profile. And that's where you put temperature and humidity probes inside just the empty sterilizer to show that it's running the way it's supposed to be. It's running within its tolerances. And your temperature range is right where you need it to be. And then you're going to do a series of half cycles. And uh, typically, you're going to run a series of three half cycles to show repeatability. So in triplicate, you're going to show that I can kill this product in half the time when we've scaled up now to our large production load. Because that, that testing we talked about earlier, the comparative resistance testing, is done in a laboratory vessel to, to compare products side by side. 
but now we've scaled up where we may be doing multiple pallets, so we want to find out uh, and make sure that that works. So you have to be able to show that you have three separate half cycles that give you complete kill of the biological indicators. The bottom line is you have to have three half cycles of whatever your worst case load size is. And so your validation again consists of your empty chamber profile, three half cycles or more if your load size is going to change, and then you're going to do three full cycles to get residual data because the full cycle is what your routine product is going to go through. So you have to have samples that you test for ethylene oxide and ethylene chlorohydrin residuals to show that after this full length cycle that the residuals are underneath the standards that are in the uh, ethylene oxide residual standard. What batch release testing is, is you basically are doing a, a mini validation on each separate batch so that each batch stands alone on its own merit. So you're going to do a half cycle followed by a full cycle on the same product. So the actual product that you're going to use on patients goes through one and a half times. It goes through the half and the full cycle. So it's even more overkill than we talked about up front where you have to kill you know, the BIs in half the time and then uh, you go through the full cycle. So you actually do both cycles. Ethylene oxide, what the standards say is you basically look at your validation every year to see what has changed, if any of your vendors changed, your materials, um, the history of positives, have you had any cycles that have failed, anything that would cause you to have to do revalidation work. So you look at that every year and assess to what degree you have to revalidate. But you can't go more than two years without doing an actual physical run where you do a half cycle to verify that everything still works. Um, that being said, the industry standard, and what FDA likes to see is, is for people to do a revalidation cycle, an actual cycle, once a year. So that's basically the indus industry standard, once a year, where you, if you're doing radiation, you're going to do quarterly audits where you have to do work every three months. With ethylene oxide, the nice thing about it is you're only revalidating once a year or in some cases only once every two years if, if nothing has changed. So it makes it really user-friendly in that respect that once you get past the full, all the work you've had to do up front, then it's just a minimal amount of work uh, once a year or in, unless things change.